Hallelujah. I want to commend each of you that are responding to the Spirit of the Lord who came with intention in your heart, determined to magnify the Lord. I watched as Pastor Goff began to encourage worship and the somber faces that that I looked out across this congregation. I seen some that came and they were determined, Sister Amanda, they were determined to praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. And I watched Brother Goff as, as those who, who were determined, as they just let go of everything that was holding them back, as they began to just put away out of their mind all the distractions, as God began to wrap his loving arms. And he said, this is what I was looking for. Yeah. I've been waiting for you to come to me like this. I've been waiting for this appointment. Hallelujah. 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 No doubt. Uh, amen. There's so much more where that came from. Yeah. God's got something special in store for this service tonight. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful to this good church. Each of you who have been faithful to the house of the Lord. If you can, you can return to your seats if you wish. If you want to stay in the front, you're welcome to. Amen. I feel God's presence in this place tonight. Hallelujah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for his blessings. I'm grateful for his presence tonight. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 7 as a text. I want to say how much I miss, miss Bishop, Sister Riggin. Amen. We're praying for them. I know that they're listening in. I want you to know, Pastor, I said a prayer for you before service tonight. And praying for Sister Riggin, praying that the Lord would keep his traveling mercies upon them. Amen. And, and then that the Lord would give them peace during this time. Give them comfort. So their family praying for Rusty too. And for Curtis, their family. I mean, if you've never been to a church on a Sunday night, you might be scratching your head wondering what is going on here. What kind of church is this? And if you have come to a church on a Sunday night and they, you haven't yet seen a service like this, you also might be scratching your head and like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. Amen. But I'm here to tell you the power of the Holy Ghost is more powerful than any drug. Amen. Than any form of alcohol. It tastes better. It feels better. And it is better. There's nothing like it. Amen. I, there's nothing like being in the presence of the Lord, just like we were just in a few moments ago as the Spirit of God began. That was an authentic move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. What you felt was wave after wave of spontaneous unction from the Holy One. From the Spirit of God as he began to move in this house. Amen. As folks made themselves available to him as vessels of honor. Amen. God would fill. Amen. And God wants to do that for every member of this congregation tonight. God wants you to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That is his presence. That is his spirit. Amen. To dwell on you. Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 through 8. Amen. We'll take as a text tonight. Amen. This message began a few weeks ago, and I had it on the plan, on the books to uh, preach it. Amen. But the Holy Ghost stepped into the service, and, and I didn't get an opportunity, and I don't mind it when that happens. In fact, I started to think that that might happen tonight, Brother Goff. Maybe this is just the one. I put that one in the filing cabinet as Holy Ghost blowout. That way, every time I bring it up, then we're just going to have a Holy Ghost blowout. Amen. But I believe the Lord wants to say something to this congregation tonight. Amen. Do you have an ear to hear what the Spirit would say? Yes, Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8 says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Everybody say, shall. shall. Seek, and ye shall find. Everybody say, shall. shall. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Everybody say, shall. shall. Now, do you think Jesus is playing around? You think he's playing with us? He's got a gimmick here that he wants you to try to, if you, if you hold your mouth right, if you get the right grip, Brother Hall, then it just might have, no. He said, ask and it shall. Seek and ye shall find. 
Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Hallelujah. I'm staring at a congregation tonight. Amen. Who may be standing in front of doors who you've been waiting to open. Amen. I'm here to tell you that you just need to begin to knock. Hallelujah. Let's lay down our Bibles tonight and ask the Lord to help us. Jesus, we ask you for your anointing on this congregation. Lord, give us ears to hear. God, I pray, give us grace, Lord, to receive and believe your word. Pray that you would anoint my lips, anoint my mouth, anoint my throat, God, that I might produce, God, the words that would be helpful, that would be a blessing to this church congregation. In the name of Jesus, why don't you clap your hands? hands unto the Lord and thank him for his presence in this house tonight. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to speak on the subject of opening, opening doors. Doors serve as, and I, I oftentimes I probably criticize myself more than anybody else. And I start thinking of any concept that I'm going to preach on. I try to go all the way to the very bottom. Amen. So I can understand it fully. Amen. So what's so special about doors? Doors. Amen. We interact with them on a daily basis. Every one of you walked through two sets of doors before you sat down in the pew that you're sitting in right now. Maybe more than once. Amen. But I'm here to tell you, amen, that doors in Scripture serve as a, a spiritual conduit, a spiritual symbol that God uses, uh, amen, to give promises to his people. Amen. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I believe the Lord has made some special promises uh, to special people under the sound of my voice tonight and God wants you amen to see that door opened hallelujah amen doors serve as a gateway controlling amen and governing those who are uh, permitted to exit and to enter into a given space their thresholds delineate two separate places that serve two separate purposes amen in your home you might have one room that's intended for cooking or eating and another for sitting and talking reading you might have one that is intended for sleeping, and then another one for washing away the dirt and the grime of the day. When you step over the threshold of a door, of an open door, you have moved from one place to another, amen, and presumably as you move from that place to the other, you go with intention. Now, if you're me, amen, you go from one room to another, and then you got to go back to the other room because you forgot what it was that you were going into that room for in the first place. Amen. Thank God I'm not the only one that has this problem. Amen. Because I've seen it happen. Amen. On others before. Amen. But most of the time, most of the time, even the times that you forget, you go into that room with a purpose. You go in there to get something. You go in there perhaps to grab your clothes or grab a towel or, or grab your glasses or grab a toothbrush or, or grab a hairbrush or some hairspray. Uh, amen. Many of us did this tonight as we prepared to come to church today. Amen. And as you go from one room to another, you go into that room because that room serves a specific purpose for you. When you, when you go there, not just anybody though can open every door in the house. There's certain doors when I was growing up that I could not open. My grandma's closet was one of them where she stored all the gifts for Christmas throughout the year. And it was a privilege, even, to go into her room because there was another door in that room that was very special to her. It was her small refrigerator door. And it had all her snacks in it. And I was not permitted to open that door without my grandma's permission. And so there are doors as we go, amen, from one place to another in our homes. Amen. How many of you have an older or a younger sister? How many of you have tried to go into that younger or older sister's room without her permission. <laughs> Your ears begin to bleed from the scream as she yells, get out of my room. This is my room. 
This is my door. And I've been there. I've been, amen, uh, barging into my sister's room unannounced without permission and promptly got kicked out uh, by a heel or a flip-flop or something or a, or a piercing scream. <clears throat> amen. Or your mom and dad's room. That's a special place. They, you don't want to walk in their room without their approval. Uh, permission because that's where dad keeps the guns that's where dad ke- that's where mom keeps her special uh, gifts from her parents or perhaps the the curio cabinet where all the gifts from the family tradition are stored and and if you open that door there's risk involved you're going to get more than a heel or a flip-flop you're going to get a flip-flop right upside your backside that's what you're going to get or how about going to a friend's home you you don't just show up there and open the door. What do you do? Hello? Sometimes some of us send a text, hey, I'm on my way. I'm gonna be there soon. Some of us don't even feel comfortable driving up in the driveway without their permission. (laughs) Now some of us don't have any uh, consideration at all and so let this be a notice to you that you ought to pick up some additional consideration before you show up to somebody's home. (laughs) Don't just open the door if it's not your home. But, hey, we had an appointment. I was planning on coming by to pick up something or drop off my dog or whatever the case might be. I came over to have some tea. I don't know if people do that anymore. I sure don't. I don't drink. And I'll drink coffee with you, but I won't drink any tea. But uh, I don't mind sweet tea, but I don't like hot tea or any of that other stuff, and I'm totally getting distracted, so help me get along. But I don't just go into my friend or my neighbor's home without their permission. I have to knock first. Perhaps this, this responsibility, this, this permission giving, is more ki- clearly illustrated in those large doors that once secured cities, in the, the large defense, walls of defense that stood around as when pastor invited my wife and I, Sister Riggin and pastor invited my wife and I to go to Israel to dig at the the Shiloh dig, what we were digging at was at the gate, the very door to that city. And Brother Goff, as as we got lower and lower, we probably covered, I don't know, four or six feet down. And we weren't even at the bottom of the wall. We started probably two or three feet from the top. And so we dug down. So by the time we were done, it was between six and eight feet from the top of that wall. And we still hadn't found the bottom. We still hadn't found the floor. But that, there is, there's no way in my mind, Brother Goff, with those ancient weapons, how, how, I can, how, how can these folks overthrow a city like even just Shiloh? It wasn't some masterpiece. It wasn't some uh, bulwark. It wasn't some amazing defense, defense system. It was just a typical city in those olden days, and, and it was just walled and stone upon stone, and big stones, big old, big old blocks, but right in the middle of the wall was a beautiful door that allowed people to go in and to come out. Amen. And those who were going into Shiloh were going in with a specific purpose. They didn't just go there because uh, they wanted to, but and, and perhaps some did, but even though, uh, even, even those who just went because they wanted to. The purpose was because they wanted to, but perhaps they had family members there. Or perhaps they were a part, uh, amen, of the services that went on in that special city. Amen. But they had a purpose to go there and they had to obtain permission. It, it's up to that person, the, the guard, the, the, the watchman that was standing there at the door to determine, does this person Does this person require authorization or not? Does he get permission or not? And he better make the right decision. He better make the right call because if that person has any form of weaponry, if that person is there to open up the door for some others that would come in and try to overthrow that city, that decision, that responsibility lies upon the guard, the one standing at the door, the doorkeeper, if you will. Hallelujah. We're all doorkeepers in the house of God. 
Each of us have a responsibility. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We'll get here in just a minute. But each of you, as you sit in this congregation, you are holding the key to the door, amen, to this service. Amen. God wants to you to ask you, would you open the door? I'd like to come in. I've got a purpose. I have a desire. If you just open the door. Open the door. Open the door. Hallelujah. When God closes a door, no man can open it. The Bible tells us or teaches us this principle in Genesis chapter 7. When in the last days of Noah's time, that verse 13 of Genesis chapter 7, I'll just read it for you. It says, in the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and three wives of his sons with him into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, every fowl after their, his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded them. Before I go any for, further, let me tell you that every soul, every body every animal that went into that ark went in there with a purpose went in there for the breath of life it said it said where in in this noah's ark in noah's ark was the breath of life if they had not gone through that open door in just a few days their life would be snuffed out they wouldn't have any other options, any other hope. No other doors could be open to them. But the Bible tells us in this passage that, and the Lord shut him in. And by shutting Noah and his sons and those animals into the ark, he shut everyone else out. We see with this simple illustration with the door of Noah's ark when it was shut that the Bible tells us that the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. And, and, and I want to submit to you that no matter how many people were beating on the side of that ark, no matter how many people were knocking on the door after he closed the door, no matter how many people Tried. The Bible amen, indicates to us in this reading that, that Noah could not open that door. That door was shut. There was not another opportunity for Noah to go and open the door and say, hey, that's my cousin. That's my friend. That's my neighbor. I recognize him. I recognize her. Hallelujah. I've heard some preach that, that he couldn't open the door. He had no power to open the door. Amen. The Bible teaches us the principle, and I'm just going to hit this and move on. But in the last day of this generation, the Bible says that the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. But in the last day, there is going to come a time when a door closes for good. Luke chapter 13, verse 23 says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. There are many that are going to be knocking on that door, presumably just like on the door of Noah's ark. Amen. As the rain began to descend, Noah, Noah, I didn't believe what you were saying. Amen. But I want you to open this door. Let me in. Let me in. And Noah couldn't open that door. The Bible tells us in verse 25 that once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door. And ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say to you, I know you not whence ye are. 
Then he shall begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. And he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. I don't even... I don't even want to try to imagine what that day is going to be like. I feel the Holy Ghost trying to reach for somebody right now. I want you to, to imagine with me for a moment, amen, what it was like for those people who just wanted another chance at life. Would you open the door? Noah, Noah, open the door. No. The master of the house has closed this door. I don't have any authority. I don't have the permission to open this door. As much as Bishop Brigham would want to, in those last days when the Lord finally shuts the door of opportunity to salvation, amen, he can't open that door. As much as I would want to, or Pastor Goff, or anyone in this congregation would want to, uh, amen, there is nothing we can do when God shuts the door, when the man of the house rises up and says it's time. It's time to shut the door. We can't open that door. Doesn't matter how long we knock. Doesn't matter how long we cry. That door is not going to open. But I've got good news for somebody tonight. That door is not shut yet. Tonight, it's wide open. Tonight, the door is wide open. The master is waiting for you to join us in the house. The master has called. Hey, he sent out an invitation. Hey, I've got a party in here. I've got plenty of food. I've got enough sustenance for you if you would just come on through this open door. Amen. But just like in the days of Noah, the people that were standing on the outside of Noah and saying, wonder what he's doing. Wonder why he's swinging that hammer every day. I wonder why he's bringing so much wood into this area. I wonder why he's working so hard. Amen. We've never seen or heard of anything. What is rain? I don't understand what he's talking about. Amen. But friend, I want you to understand. You need to get an understanding of what Noah's talking about. We need to get an understanding what it means to walk through that door. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish I could preach this the way I feel. I'm trying to preserve my voice. Amen. Because I want to get somewhere tonight. Amen. But you, amen, I, I appeal to everyone under the sound of my voice. Amen. If that door is still open, it is up to you to go through it. Lord gave to Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven to open doors to different Folks of different walks of life. Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 tells us, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When you lock the door, it's going to be locked. If you unlock the door, it's going to be open. Peter, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And we can read throughout the book of Acts as the Lord used him to open the door. Amen. To the Jews and then to the Gentiles and then to the, to the Samaritans and then to the Gentiles. Every nationality, every type of person. Amen. Whether white or black, whether, uh, whether red or brown, no matter what color, no matter what background. Amen. Peter opened the door to all of humanity. Everybody, everybody, this door is wide open. Amen. The Bible tells us, amen, that he opened the door of faith. Acts chapter 14, verse 27 says, when they were come, he had gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. It opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Hallelujah. We wouldn't be here tonight if he hadn't opened that door. We wouldn't be in here feeling what we have felt in this worship service unless the Lord had permitted us to go through that open door. I'm so thankful. That's why I lift my hands. Amen. When we sing, I will praise the Lord. 
That's when God's glory begins to fall. Amen. I begin to think, uh, amen, I don't even deserve to be here right now. But he opened the door. He permitted me to come into this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The psalmist told us in Psalm 84, verse 10, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. This is our choice, ch child of God. This is our choice, friend. Amen. That whether we want to or not, there's really only a binary option here. Amen. You can either be a doorkeeper in the house of God or you can be a dweller in tents. There's a lot more security in the house of God. There's a lot more protection. I don't have time to get into everything that I want to preach. Uh, amen. But there's a lot of protection. Uh, amen. From the elements of the world. Uh, amen. For the influence of this world. Uh, the perversion in this world. Uh, in the house of God. Uh, amen. Those tents uh, consisting of nothing but fabric. Uh, how are they going to protect you from the onslaught of the enemy? But if you are a doorkeeper in the house of God. You have built-in protection. You have built-in, amen, livelihood. You can sustain your food, your produce much better in the house of God than in the tents of wickedness. Amen. I alluded to this just a moment ago, but I mean, I've got one more scripture to give and then we'll be where I want to be. Amen. But we, I mentioned that we're doorkeepers. We're doorkeepers in the house of God. Amen. And I watched just a few moments ago as several folks threw that door wide open. They said, God, right here, I want you to fill this heart. I want you to come on into this door. You, you understand that the door to your heart, to your mind, to your spirit, you're the only one that has control over that. Not even God will force that door open. He can, but he won't. He, ha he certainly has the, he created it, of course. I, put that out of your mind. Let's just think about, amen, what God, the rules of operation that God works within. God will not, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force you to serve him. He's not going to force you to live for him. Amen. But if the heart, so, so if the door to your heart, the door in your spirit is closed, only you have the key to that door. Only you can open that door. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at that door and I knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. Amen. You may not know it. You may not realize it. You may have not opened that door before. But let me try to give you a testimony that as soon as you do, you'll never want to close the door again. When God comes in to sup with you and to dine with you and to commune with you, there's nothing like it. Many of us will throw the door open to all the advances of this world, to all the temptations of life, amen, to all of the vices, amen, of this world. And we try, we try, we try. God, I'd love to close this door. I'd love to, I'd love to shut this door in my life. I, I wish to God I'd never open the door for that to come in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if you open the door to God, let me tell you, he will help you shut that door. In fact, he's got the key that will lock it. And you never have to worry about that door opening again. If you're addicted, amen, to any form of substance, I'm telling you, God has the key to deliver you from that. You think, well, this has been in my life. This has been in my family for so long. I mean, I don't care how long. I mean, I read of a demoniac. I mean, that was bound by a legion of devils, over 2,000. I mean, and God delivered him in the moment. Hallelujah. You can't convince me that your situation is worse than that. Amen. I'm going to try my best to convince somebody in this place that God wants to come through your open door. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, that scripture clearly uses doors as a, as a symbol. Amen. To, to uh, describe God's promises. Things that God would like to do. Places in life that God would like to, like to take you. I like how Brother Goff mentioned it this morning. He said, so the devil likes to uh, bargain with your past. God holds your future. I mean, God holds your future. Amen. You, you feel like, uh, amen, you're always going to be like you, who you are. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to be. You don't have to be the same person that you were when you walked in. And you say, well, Brother Hilton, my mom's like this. My dad's like this. I don't care who your mom is. I don't care who your dad is. Amen. We serve the father of life. Amen. Who can give life and can take away. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God opens and closes certain doors. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 12, 2, verse 12, Paul indicated in, in, in multiple occasions in his epistles to the Corinthians that the Lord opened a door for him. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened unto me of the Lord. Amen. Paul said, I tried, I tried, I tried to, to open that door. Amen. But I couldn't get the right grip. Amen. But I prayed and God open the door for me. 1 Corinthians 16 and 9 says, for a great and effectual is open unto me. A great door and effectual is open unto me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a great opportunity. When God opens the door for you, child of God, amen, what an opportunity stands before you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible teaches us in verse 8, we wrote just a moment ago of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. But Revelation chapter 3, verse 8 tells us this. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. No man can shut it. There is nobody in this world... Hey, you know what? That includes you. Are you hearing me tonight? That includes me. I can't shut the door that God opens. I can't open a door that God shuts. Amen. I'm, I'm almost there. I, I promise. I, I, I'm trying to, I want you to, I, I hope that I can get across what I'm trying to uh, say tonight. And if, if you've got any questions after service, feel free to ask me because I bear the brunt of the responsibility here. Amen. But I want you to understand, amen, that these doors that, that are, are laying before you, amen, should I take that job or should I not take that job? Amen. Should I move on in life and move to this place or that place uh, or should I just uh, bear down right here, here and build a family or, or should I or should I try uh, to change my life uh, I mean the last time I tried uh, I mean I couldn't do it hallelujah hey you know the difference between those chances and those efforts and now is that you are opening and closing those doors I mean but if you turn the door over to God and say God I don't know which one you open the right door, and you close the wrong one. You, you show me the way here. And if you pray that in earnest, amen, this is not where I intended to be, but this is where we're at right now, amen. But if you pray that prayer in earnest, amen, you can't, amen, you cannot, you hear me tonight, you can't open the door that God shuts, and you can't close the door that God opens. God will give you clear directions. The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God will give you a direct path. God will show you. He'll show you the straight and the narrow. Amen. He doesn't leave it up to chance. Amen. But you've got to earnestly pray, God. Would you open this door? God. Would you open this door? God. 
Would you open this? And if we're patient enough, if we pray enough, if we knock enough, then the right door will open. But Brother Goff, if I go bombarding into that room, I may not like what's on the other side of that door. I might have all the ambition in the world, Brother Josh, and just bust through the door and then discover this was one I shouldn't have opened. I've been there before. And I left that room licking my wounds, <laughs> praying God to have mercy on me. God, I wish I had never opened that door. I wish I'd never let that into my life. God, I'm praying next time you would help me to be more sensitive. He said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Do you believe God's word? Do you believe God's promises here? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I know we're not hyping and hopping and running around and standing on our hands, but I feel like the Holy Ghost is ministering to some folks, Brother Jerome. I feel like God's talking to us. If anybody, maybe I'm just preaching to myself, and that's okay. That's okay. Bishop Lambeth, I mean, a couple weeks ago, he talked about if you can't listen to yourself preach, then you better not be preaching at all. <laughs> so I, I hope I could take my own preaching. I've said before you, church, pastor has brought before this church many, many times. Elder Davis has brought before this church, I believe it was at least two occasions, maybe just once. I, I may be misremembering that, but I know for sure once. I mean, the promises of an open door. And we stand at that open door. We don't, we don't have the option of closing it. If God opens the door, we can't close it. What we do have the option of is going through it. Amen. Acts chapter 12, verses 5 through 6 tells us a story in Scripture. And this is my final passage, uh, final set of Scriptures that I want to go through. And, and then I will be done. This is really where I want it to be. Amen. So everything, if you haven't heard anything that I've said up to this point, here's the time to turn up the volume in your ears and, and listen, if you will. Peter was kept in a prison, the Bible says, in Acts chapter 12, verse 5. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church. There was a church body that learned how to pray and knock on the door. God, the, the apostle, is locked up in prison. The context is that Herod had just killed James the brother of John. And when he saw how, the, how his constituents responded positively to that, he decided, hey, I'm going to do that again. And so he picked out another of Jesus' disciples, Peter, and put him in prison. That's where we pick up in verse 5. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Verse 6, and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. The situation seemed absolutely hopeless. Peter is the next one on the chopping block. In fact, this is the last night before the king is getting ready to execute Apostle Peter. If Peter could have broken out of that jail, I guarantee he would have given every effort to break out of that jail. But he was locked down by two chains, two soldiers, and door keepers who kept the prison doors. Since things were locked down and Peter is bound in chains and he's sleeping 
between two soldiers. I want to bring to your attention tonight, amen, what it was, amen, that set Peter free. If you know the story, amen, the Bible tells us, amen, that Peter gets up and he walks through three gates, three opportunities for doors to stop him. Acts chapter 12, verse 7 says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. Get up, Bible says, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands, and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. And when they were passed through the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. I'm here to tell you that when Peter was locked down by these chains. Amen. Peter, amen, seemed like he had no hope of opening doors. Peter was the last one that had access to the keys of the prison gates. Amen. That kept him in that prison cell. Amen. But there was one greater, amen, that was being prayed to. Somebody was knocking. Said, Lord, you see where Peter's at right now. God, you see Peter laying on the ground. You see Peter, amen, between the two souls. God, have mercy on us. We need this man. We can't go another day with him out of this prison. If we do, his life is in jeopardy. Hallelujah. Somebody began to knock. Somebody began to pray. God, open this door. God, open the door. God, make a way. The Bible says they went past the first ward. They went past the second ward. And then they went past a gate which opened of its own accord. And then he came to another door. Let's keep reading. Acts chapter 12 verse 12 says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. What, were, what do you think they were praying for? They were praying for Peter. They were praying for Peter's liberty. That Peter would be set free. That God would open doors for Peter. That's what they were praying. And behold, Peter was standing on the outside of their door. As they were praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate... A damsel came and hearken, came to hearken named Rhoda. Now Rhoda comes in. I know you guys know the story. Just, just bear with me if you will. And then she, she came and she, when she knew Peter's voice, she didn't open the gate. The Bible says in verse 13 that as Peter knocked the gate, the damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. Verse 14, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate. For gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Guys, you won't believe it. You will not believe who just knocked on our door. Can you imagine? Peter is outside. You guys hear the guy knock? That's Peter. Really? Really, Rhoda. If it was Peter, you would open the door and let him in. And the Bible tells us that they didn't believe her. Let me see if I can. Yeah, verse, let's keep reading. She opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said to her, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. <laughs> and these folks had a lot of faith for a lot of other things, except for the answer to their prayer. They had a lot of faith for angels that was visiting them. They had, wow, this is just a, just a dynamic prayer meeting. But the answer to their prayers on the other side of a door that they had permission to open. 
Peter continued knocking in verse 16, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Bible tells us that Peter continued knocking until that door was open. What else could he do? He didn't have the key to the door. He didn't have permission to open that door. And this is the only second point. I've only got two main points. Number one is that God can open and close doors. And that whatever door God opens or closes, we cannot close or open that door. Amen. But there's a second type of door. Amen. That God entrusts to us to open. Amen. That through our prayers, somebody hear me tonight, that through your prayers, God is trusting that you would open a door. Hallelujah. Amen. There were others in the house. Uh, amen. That could open the door. It wasn't just up to Rhoda, but anybody inside of that house uh, that was praying uh, under the unction of the Holy Ghost uh, had the key to open that door. God trusts us to open the doors that are possible for us to open. And we should trust him to open the doors that are impossible. Hallelujah. Bible says that when they had opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. They were shocked. Caught him off guard. They didn't expect him to be on the other side of that door. But God was waiting on them. God was waiting on them, Brother Goff, to open that door. Some of us are praying, God, would you please fix this situation? God, would you please, amen. And all the while we're ignoring, amen, him knocking on a door that we should open. That we, amen, are required to open. Amen. He's put that job in your lap. Amen. It's up to you to continue working that job. Amen. And being faithful. Bible tells us that if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Amen. He that doesn't work is worse than an infidel. That's scripture. Amen. God puts these doors in our life for us to open. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe this morning, Pastor was, Brother Goff and I were talking, Pastor Brother Goff and I were talking right here, and Brother Goff said, can we stay around tonight and hear Brother Hilton preach? And I said, Bishop, can I pull your card and ask him to preach? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps uh, that would have been better for you. Perhaps that would be better for this service but i believe that god has something special for this service amen yet yet before you leave this house that if you are willing to come up to this door and knock and if if it doesn't open then perhaps it's a door that you can open perhaps it's a door that you should be opening maybe you ought to pray maybe you ought to talk to your pastor Maybe you ought to say, Pastor, I've been struggling with this situation. God has been, I've been really wrestling with this situation. And I don't know how to go. I don't know what my next step ought to be. I'll tell you one that's praying for you right now. Amen. Maybe not in this very moment, but that prays for you perhaps more than any. And that would be Bishop and Sister Riggin. Who pray constantly. I've been in the prayer meetings with them when I've heard your name called. Knocking on the doors of heaven for you. Asking that God would open doors that are blocking you. Asking that God would give you a way whenever it seems like there is no way. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 12 verse 5 tells us an important part of what set Peter free that day. Therefore, Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing. Sister Tori, you can come. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. This is why it's so important to have a church family. Because when you can't pray for yourself, when you, when you don't have the strength to pray on your own, there are others. Yeah, Bishop and Sister Reagan are praying, but I'm also, I'll, I would go as far to say that there are people in this room that have prayed for other people in this room. Wow. <laughs> It's not, it's, I'm not intending to bring anything profound. I just want to be a help to somebody tonight who may be standing before a closed door and you're just scratching. Why, God? Why is this not opening? 
You put me here. You brought me here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. That's a command from the apostle. Pray without ceasing. I've got one more passage of scripture to read, and then we can all stand. In fact, why don't we all stand together? It's a story you can begin to play. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is, is, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. And I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. If you're willing to continue to knock, or if you're willing, if you could find somebody who will knock with you and just pray without ceasing, I'm here to tell you that the right doors, it, honestly, it is as simple as that. Pray. Pray without ceasing about every situation, about every question, about every doubt, about every opportunity, about every fear, about every concern. If you pray without ceasing or you seek somebody to help you pray without ceasing, then the right doors will open. I would like to open these altars tonight and begin that process of just knocking. He said, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. Are you tired of